little bit about Dimension. This meeting is being recorded. Say again. Sorry, I had a notice pop up that was rather loud. Yeah, that's Garrett. Uh, do you know anything about these dimensions or some dimensions? I guess you're technical, so you might know. <laughs> A little. His interpretation of them was interesting read. Not entire, definitely a different way I've heard fifth, sixth, and seventh described. First through fourth is typical, so nothing surprising there. Oh, wonderful. Which, it'll be interesting to see how he explains it. Okay, I see Will just arrived and Eleanor, and Rose, um, and Tony. Uh, Rose, I don't think I've spoke to you before. Hi, Liz. Yes, we, we talked before oh, a few months ago. Oh, wonderful. And uh, what interests you about tonight's topic? Um, I, I love the scientific aspect of it. Um, I love science and I, I love the scientific aspect of it. So I'm, cu I'm very curious to see what Garrett gonna say. Oh, that's great. And for everybody in the chat, I put Garrett's essay if you'd like to uh, read it quickly. Is there anyone else that'd like to introduce themselves? Don't be shy. We'd love to hear from you all. Well, I'll speak if no one else will. Uh, hello, I'm Will, sunny coast, Queensland, Australia, part of the British colony. God save the king. <laughs> uh, it's nine, eight, nearly 9 a.m. here. And I'm pleased to announce that there are no uh, other civilizations have arrived overnight. So you can all sleep well, knowing that in the morning, chances are you won't wake up to find some sort of alien creature on every street corner asking for identification as you walk by. Uh, I'm interested in higher dimensions, I guess. I've just looked at the blurb then, so I haven't really got my head around what it means in this context, but you know, given my, I'm a bit of a one trick pony with my philosophy that something arose from nothing or alternatively it existed infinitely without first cause. I believe this to be beyond human comprehension and therefore all bets are off. I'm not ruling out perhaps other entities. Um, is that what you mean Garrett by higher dimensions? Like, uh, other intelligences or no other... that was that was when we talked about aliens we talked about the idea of other types. Yo, is my mic working you all hear me yeah we can hear you joe um and i have to lock down the permissions i just realized i didn't do that so yeah don't forget to make us host too i did i did make you guys host Yeah, so I guess we're talking other realms, other uh, parallel universes, that sort of thing. Is it? I didn't that actually read parallel it. universes is one of the dimensions, so we'll get into that. So I'll uh, I'll try to describe it. It's a little bit tonight uh, is a very like I normally focus on practical philosophy. Tonight is a very theoretical, um, you know, very little practical application in what I'm going to talk about tonight. In you know, got mail. So I think uh, Joe, you know, if you're a troll, um, you might you might want to consider better use of your time. Um, if you need any uh, life coaching, feel free to reach out. Um, uh, I know Zoom bomber. I just have an name, so it just goes off the line, you know. <laughs> That's literally Adam as Joe, like, like, dude, you're caught. You know, he, he was probably a troll. 
and I think someone removed him, assuming that. Probably a fair I just bet. removed him. Yeah, no, I, I didn't. Think, I didn't. I think that was a good bet, Ellis. So thanks. So, um, Will, what is this new uh, photo about here with the bunny rabbit? I'm not sure. I just thought it was in my uh, in my pictures library on my computer. So, I think it's uh, Alice in Wonderland. I'm thinking, or a, sort of a derivative of that, which could relate to other realms. I guess. Yeah, I, I I'm going to try to make the argument that that photo you have actually exists in some parallel dimension and some part of the extended many worlds that um, I think potentially really exist, but potentially don't. I don't know if they really exist, but hypothetically exist. Uh, may, it may hypothetically exist somewhere. Oh. So, I mean, the philosopher Don Hoffman talks about our ability to navigate our environment as per the, our evolved senses. So, I'm, you know, uh, I find that of interest as well, that perhaps there are, you know, we've, got, we've just scraped the surface of reality with, with sight, sound, touch, taste, and, uh, and um, the mind is the sixth sense. If you if you count the mind, so we, we could just be looking like at a veneer, um, and, and we're just interfacing with that. According to Don Hoffman, the philosopher, and he, he said that theories actually sent him a little bit crazy. <laughs> um, so, I mean, he talks about like I think of the example of say a red cushion on a couch in another room. Is it red? when you're not looking at it. It, 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 quite obviously it's not. If it has to be observed before it assumes any properties. We um, can, we can yeah. talk about that. Um, well, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I would posit that yeah. it's still red um, and that it's emitting the same wave, wavelengths of light that if it were observed that it, it would be seen that it was red. Um, and so for me, the, the question of whether or not it's actually read at that moment in time is irrelevant to whether or not it's being observed, but, um, I can explain why, why the quantum mechanics, uh, seem to quantum mechanics, uh, uh, PhDs seem to try to deny objective reality exists until it's observed. That's a, probably like a digression. And if people want to go down that path, we can, um, because I, I don't know how much conversation there will be about tonight's topic. We'll see. We can uh, talk about it until people are tired of talking about it. And once they are, we can talk about something else. So would anyone else like to introduce themselves and um, say something about tonight's topic or anything on your mind? Just what well, no one's going to speak, Garrett. Uh, a pity uh, this had, hadn't come to light last week with the UFO thing because there's been a huge. Uh, have you seen this whistleblower guy from the US military came out? Highly credible US ex military intelligence. That came out, that came out the night um, the night that we had the event, and people mentioned the article. Uh, Was it? Yeah. So you said they've got hundreds of craft that have been reverse that were reverse engineered yeah yeah i didn't hear that it was hundreds of craft that were reverse engineered but um you know uh yeah interesting look pretty sounds credible like there are more sounds like there were more details released since since i last heard so hey garrett i wanted to thank you for referring me to, <clears throat> to the book what's chat gpt and why does it work i read that um, and uh, very good book. Thank you. Which book? Uh, what's Chat GPT and why does it work? You referenced that in, our, in the last meeting. Oh, I don't know if I referenced it. Maybe someone else did because I haven't read that. I I did a um, I did a, um, a demo of Chat GPT and um, but I don't I don't think I referenced the book so. I don't want to take credit for something I didn't help you on. <laughs> so, but I appreciate the credit nonetheless. 
but I don't want to take credit if I didn't actually help you. But hopefully someone did. And, you know, we have, I have a saying, which is if we don't help each other, who's going to help us? So someone in the community helped you, and I'm glad that they did. Everyone's kind of quiet, Garrett. Do you want to start soon? Seven. Yeah, why not? Like, let's get started. Um, and uh, let me uh, start with the uh, intro. So um, first of all, I'll introduce myself for people who don't know me. My name is Garrett Lang. I'm a software developer turned software inventor for over uh, two decades. Now an entrepreneur. My hobby is writing and discussing practical philosophy. And I'm also the executive director of the Freethinker Institute, which is the organization that brought, brings you tonight's events and this series of events on Tuesday evenings. Um, we're a not-for-profit looking to support and empower members. We focus on helping people be the best version of themselves, seek truth, and be fair through transformational personal and professional development. Um, we have free events like this on every Tuesday evening, covering a wide range of topics not typically covered in academia or industry. And we have weekly members events uh, for people interested in applying practical wisdom into their daily lives, into our daily lives. Um, we have only one rule in the FTI, and that is to remain polite. That keeps the conversation at a, you know, a non-emotional level, um, which keeps things, you know, thoughtful. Um, I would encourage everyone if they hear something, if you hear something that makes you feel like that thing is crazy, start asking questions about why that person believes what they do, including me. Um, you're welcome to ask me why I believe what I do. Um, and, uh, you know, that way we better understand other people's perspectives that may not make sense to us without asking some questions. Um, it's also a more polite way to, um, to, to better understand something that you disagree with, um, which is usually better than trying to just jump to the conclusion that it's wrong and trying to tell the person why it's wrong. That doesn't really teach us anything, uh, much better to do what we call listening to understand in the FTI, um, which is what I just described. So with that said, um, I did mention earlier, but we have a bunch of people that have joined since then. So I'm going to mention again um, that tonight's discussion is almost entirely theoretical, as far as I can tell. Um, but um, I this was the first uh, philosophical essay that I ever wrote. And so um, I figured, why not present it? Um, because uh, we didn't have anything this week and I needed something to present. And so I figured we'll do this one. Um, and I, I think it did come up tangentially in a, another conversation, uh, another evening. And so that was probably what made me even remember it. Um, so that said, um, you know, tonight's uh, conversation will be about higher dimensions. Um, and I'll talk through, you know, what that means. It's kind of like, you know, we, we observe the world is, three-dimensional we see things in three dimensions um and then you can you know imagine like a two-dimensional um object and a one-dimensional uh, like a, a one-dimensional object is like a line a two-dimensional object is like a you know a a, a plane or a, a square um like on a piece of paper but not even a piece of paper thin but literally not not any depth at all and so i'm going to talk about starting from the zeroth dimension um all the way up to um, uh, dimension six. And my essay had seven dimensions. Um, when I was preparing for this uh, discussion, I realized that I think the sixth and seventh dimensions really, or the fifth and sixth dimensions really can be collapsed in our one dimension uh, rather than two separate dimensions. So we can talk through that um, and why I did that. If anyone is interested, um, I can be convinced that I'm wrong at any time. So. Maybe maybe the original seven was right, but I think actually that there are six dimensions that I can conceive of, and they get pretty darn abstract at number six, um, and so um, and super theoretical. Um, so that said, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now, and uh, hopefully you guys can see my screen. And so, um, uh, let me. Pull up the presenter view. Okay. So, um, and let me get my video. Okay. So, um, and Michael, I'm going to make you a host too, just in case we get Zoom bombed. Um, and then, um, so let's start with dimension zero. Dimension zero is basically a point. It doesn't have any, like, um, you know, like depth or space. It's just the idea or the concept of something either existing or not existing. 
And the idea is that at the zero dimension, you either have something that exists or you don't have something that exists. And it's really not more complicated than that. It either exists or it doesn't exist. There's not like a halfway to existence. It just either exists or doesn't exist. And we can argue if you want in the discussion about whether or not things can semi exist. I would argue that when they're observed, they either exist or don't exist. And, um, and so we can talk about that uh, in the discussion. Um, and we do save um, questions for the end of the presentation um, by popular demand. And then um, if uh, if people in, well, we'll get into the, the discussion stuff at the end so that it's more fresh in people's mind. So dimension number one is a line. So on a line, um, you either have something that exists or doesn't exist at any point in the line. And it um, the line is infinite length. All of these dimensions are infinite in length. And so the line goes on forever and has any combination of, um, you know, some it has some combination of things that either exist or don't exist at any point in the line. Now, when we get into dimension two, um, it's a plane. And so um, you have an infinite number of lines all in parallel, which have every possible combination of um, things existing or not existing at different points in the line. And so that's that's the idea of um, dimension two is it's a plane. Um, and it's, you know, what you'll see as a theme and the way that I came up with this essay was I took a class in linear algebra and I learned about uh, transforming multidimensional spaces. And so I sort of conceptualized um, transforming um, from three-dimensional space to four-dimensional space to five-dimensional space and upward and trying to abstract what those different spaces were. So, um, uh, so I try to use a very logical um, connection and the lower dimensions are really simple. So I'm just gonna give a little bit more background uh, during them. Um, uh, but basically, um, I try to use a very logical um, uh, paradigm where basically um, you can imagine in this plane, every, every line on the plane um, is right next to another line. And, um, and so you can imagine that um, each of those lines are kind of have something in common with each other, but are also a little bit different. And so that's a um, sort of a concept that I use throughout the essay to help me abstract to the higher level dimensions that we can't readily observe. Um, because I would argue that we can really only observe three dimensions at a single moment in time. We just observe it over time. And so we can conceptualize time and you'll see, I, I believe time is the fourth dimension, um, although um, Adam said that's not super controversial. It, it In some circles, it's controversial. I would argue that that's quite clear to me. And like, I have a high degree of confidence that time is the fourth dimension, but there are lots of people who will try to argue against that. Um, so um, that said, um, I'll try to make a good argument that it is today, so, or tonight. So, um, so the third dimension is, um, now we're gonna start to get into things that we observe. Um, it's the entire physical universe, which for those that weren't here on my essay on um, the, um, the uh, origins of the universe, I believe the physical universe is actually infinitely large. And so it's not just the observable universe that we're just some small corner of a much larger infinite universe. And so just, if you don't believe that, just hypothesize for a moment that that it's true, and um, imagine that the third dimension is an entire, you know, infinitely large physical universe at a moment in time. Um, time is not, uh, you know, we we know that time dilates, and so when we say at a moment in time, um, it is a little complicated, and I'm gonna over I'm gonna simplify um, relativity and just say, imagine that there is a moment in time um, and um, you have to understand that as you travel throughout space, uh, time can dilate a little bit. Um, but um, I'm not gonna get into that nuance until the conversation, um, but let's just 
imagine the entire physical universe at a single moment in time. Now imagine um, movement in that universe. And so, um, you know, what is if you take the entire physical universe and you collapse it down to two dimensions um, and you say, well, what what does a parallel version of the entire physical universe throughout all time? And basically, like, let me let me also say that when we're looking at three the dimension three, we're looking at the entire um, yeah. Well, it, uh, I'm I'm getting ahead of myself. So we're taking the entire um, mass mass energy configuration of the universe at a single moment in time, and then if we say that at the next moment in time we have a slightly different mass energy configuration of the universe, and at the next moment in time slightly different than that. And so you can imagine sort of stepping into um, this, you know, like a movie frame, right, where you have one moment in time, and then the next moment in time, and then the next moment in time. And as time passes, that movie frame changes, and then the mass energy of the universe is changing, and things are moving around in the universe, the, you know, the Earth is rotating around the sun, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So that brings us to the fourth dimension, which I think is quite clearly time, we are, um, I'm going to argue, um, at least four dimensional, I believe five dimensional beings that observe three dimensions. Um, and we observe three dimensions and happening, three dimensions happening over time. So we have a cognizance of time, we have a sense of time. Um, and I would argue we have a cognizance of the fifth dimension as well, which I'll get into. But um, but basically, if we if we take time to be infinite, then you can imagine a specific set of events happening over an infinite time range. And there is only one future, there is only one past. And that's really what determinism says is that there's only one future and there's only one past. And there's only one set of things that can happen. And in four dimensional space, determinism is right. Um, and there is only one future, there is only one past. And that is the mass energy configuration of the universe in that future and in that past. However, if we collapse that down, that four dimensional space down to three dimensions, where um, up and down is, um, is uh, time, and um, uh, the entire mass energy, or actually, where, um, so I, I like to say, um, you know, let me let me actually describe four dimensions as time. I like to say, imagine that a plane in three dimensional space, like we collapse three dimensional space down to two dimensions. By the way, let me describe what collapsing down means. It means that we don't lose any information from the higher dimensional space, but we visualize it um, with um, a different dimension. And so if we take the entire physical universe and we collapse it down to a plane, it still has three dimensions, but we're visualizing it in two dimensions to better understand it. And so when we're looking at time as the fourth dimension, it's easier to visualize time as the fourth dimension if we imagine all of three-dimensional space as a plane. And then we say, well, what does the next you know, moment in time look like? It's a plane parallel to the plane at the moment in time that just passed. And so um you can imagine us because time, so far as we know, and there are people who can test us, but I would argue they're wrong. Um, so far as we know, time only travels in one direction. And so I imagine us as falling through the plane of time. And so this two-dimensional space is all of three-dimensional space. When we fall, time is passing. Now, um, if we collapse down again and um, all of, uh, like all of three dimensional space is a line and a, uh, plane is, um, the entire deterministic universe, you know, throughout an infinite amount of time, what is parallel to that? And that's where it becomes parallel dimensions or parallel universes. And this is what's called the many worlds theory in physics. It's actually taken on a lot of, um, a lot of clout these days and um you know is largely defended uh by a lot of physicists and so 
the idea that the fifth dimension is parallel universes um, might be might be new so far as I know, but the idea that there are parallel universes um, is fairly fairly defensible. Um, and when I was a determinist atheist, um, which you know I was in college, um, although you know I I kind of believed in free will by the end of college because I learned about Gradel's incompleteness theorem, which is what I used to defend free will. Um, but when I wrote this essay, I was coming at it from a perspective of not having been fully convinced of free will. And so when I wrote about the fifth dimension, it really confused the heck out of me because I was like, how could you, you know, there's only one future, right? There's only one past. And um, how can you have all of these parallel universes? And, you know, um, and so the way that I thought about it is that, um, and I think, I think it made more sense once I became more in the libertarian free will bandwagon is that um, when we're falling down in the proverbial fifth dimension, we are making decisions that decide which parallel universe we're going to observe, which is a little mind boggling, but sort of has an intuitive sense to it, which is, um, you know, if I want to eat Cheerios or cornflakes for breakfast, I get to decide which one I want to eat. Now, there are two theoretically parallel universes, one in which I eat Cheerios and one in which I eat cornflakes. I get to decide, do I want Cheerios or cornflakes? My free will determines which one I'm going to decide. That determines which parallel universe I catapult into. And all of us as sentient beings are making all these decisions all the time, which is why you know, infinity is required for all of the free will decisions being made at any given time. It's a mind boggling um, kind of calculation, but it's one that, you know, I think makes intuitive sense. And then if we collapse all of the different, oh, and the other thing that um, I originally had as a separate dimension I mentioned earlier is that, um, you know, different laws of physics could create different futures too. And I, I originally had that as the sixth dimension. Now I think, you know, given how big infinity is, that um, that the universe we're experiencing might be limited in free will, but on the like the z axis, which is the up and down axis of this um, fifth dimension, there could be things so far away in the z axis that nobody's free will can get us there, and those are you know, different parallel laws of physics that could exist in different parallel dimensions um, on the, the fifth dimension. So that, that I think is theoretically possible. Now, maybe those are the sixth dimension. We can debate that um, if people want to um, in the discussion. Um, I now think that they're probably part of the fifth dimension. Now, the next question is, well, what's the sixth dimension? Um, everything that we know about has cause and effect. And it's common that um, determinists say, well, I can't imagine that, you know, something doesn't have a cause and effect and therefore there's only one possible effect. Well, that that's actually just assuming every cause and effect is deterministic. Um, for those of us that believe in libertarian free will, we still believe in everything has a cause and effect, just that it not only always has a deterministic cause and effect, meaning it can has, have a non-deterministic cause and effect. But I do believe everything is caused, just not that the cause and effect are deterministic. Um, however, the sixth dimension is a level of abstraction that is so abstract that it actually rejects cause and effect. And in parallel to cause and effect, there would be some other principle that operates. And the law of cause and effect is in philosophy called the principle of sufficient reason, which just says that for anything that happens, there is some reason that it happened not necessarily a deterministic reason. That's not part of the, the principle of sufficient reason. Um, and this gets very abstract. Again, I don't see any big practical value other than trying to you know geek out about it. Um, this is impractical philosophy, which is normally not what I focus on, like I said, um, but you know, maybe intellectually interesting for some of us. So um, a fun fact, if God is a six-dimensional omnipresent being, and my hypothesis on higher dimensions are correct, the common idea that God will know exactly what you're going to do can actually be true 
He could actually know exactly what every sentient being is going to do with absolute certainty, even if we make non-deterministic decisions on the fifth dimension. Because if you think about how we as, if I'm right, five-dimensional beings can observe um, three dimensions over time, um, you know, we can get very good predictive models and someday with physics, we may get much better predictive models um, about um, deterministic things. You know, we can see lower dimensions with, with real precision. Um, God as a six dimensional omnipresent being could actually know what we're going to do, even if, you know, even if we're navigating the fifth dimension um, through parallel universes. So that's a, you know, a fun fact that I came up with one day when sort of noodling on this um, a little bit more. So that said, I would, you know, that's the end of the presentation, a shorter one for tonight. Um, so I would love in the comments for people to um, say whether or not this was intellectually interesting and fun and say, how many dimensions do you agree with? You can just put a you know number of dimensions. Like I agree with three, four, five, six. Um, and, um, and then I want to kind of set the rules of engagement. So um, I'm going to stop the screen share in a second. And um, basically, um, when uh, we're going to take hands raised, um, where people can go to reactions on the bottom, and you'll raise your hand like I'm raising it now. And you can lower your hand after you're done asking your question. And if you raise your party hat, that means like I'm doing right now, that means you want to comment on what someone who's speaking said. Keep the comments to you know 10 or 20 seconds long. Um, when you raise your hand, try to keep it to one to two minutes long and focus on just one comment or one question per time that you raise your hand. Um, and um, am I forgetting anything, Alice? No, no, that's great. Um, I think we have 28 people, maybe uh, up to three minutes max per comment. And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, whatever, to it takes to get, whatever it takes to get one point or one question across um, up to three minutes is fine. But just try okay, to stick um, in one, one comment or question at a time. And then after you asked your question or made your comment, you can drop your hand and raise it again immediately. Oh, so. and I was also going to say, you know, raising hands is good, but um, the party hat is meant to um, join in on a conversation to make everything more conversational. So uh, we'll use it in that way. Thank you. Great. Um, <clears throat> so, um, Michael, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Uh, do you think it's reasonable <clears throat> to think of it this way? If you imagine a decision tree, Every level of a decision tree is one, one dimension. So as you go down on the decision tree from the root, which is on the top in this case, uh, you are going to the next dimension based on the decision that you make. Um, uh, so I'm not quite decided, in fact, I, I sort of lean towards a deterministic world, yet although we make decisions, we are moving from one dimension to the next based on our decision. And I, I haven't tried to look at this mathematically, uh, but I'm thinking perhaps there may be a reasonable way of looking at it, just, just uh, Want to hear your thoughts on that? Yeah, I do think um, I do think it's a like I did sort of try to do it with a decision tree, but what I did is like an abstractor decision tree rather than a human decision. Like because like right a a one dimensional thing isn't a physical thing; it doesn't physically exist one dimension, nor does two dimensions, nor does zero dimensions. They don't physically exist. The only things that physically exist are three-dimensional things. And so you kind of have to be a little level more abstract than decision trees. The, the time that I think that the decision tree makes sense, which you also described, which is um, 
there is a decision tree, I think, at a moment in time where we make a decision of what to do or what not to do. Um, and when we make a decision to do something or to not do something, I agree with you that we travel through a multidimensional, you know, parallel universe. Um, but what I would argue is that um, which which parallel universe we're going to travel to is non-deterministic, meaning that even the laws of physics themselves can't figure out which one we're going to travel into. And I have a pretty good argument for that. If you want to read my essay on free will, um, that that makes a pretty good logical argument. And I also have an essay on determinism, which I think makes a pretty good logical argument that determinism has been all but completely disproven by modern science. The only thing left is super determinism. And that's pretty hard to swallow because it basically says that subatomic particles are determined by mass energy further away than outer space. And given the inverse law fields, like given the inverse fields law, square fields law, um, generally the closest things are the ones that are the most influential physically in all the cases we are aware of. So, um, so um, yeah, that that's kind of you know where I would. And again, I don't mean to digress on free will, although we can if people want to, because I don't know how, like we don't have a lot of hands up normally. We have a lot more by now. So we may not have a long conversation. I do want to um I do want to address DLJ's comment. Um uh as far as defining dimensions, that's essentially what I tried to do in the presentation, DLJ is I think each each dimension needs to be defined independently. And what I tried to do is define what each dimension was about and so um that was that was what i tried to do um and uh Kafri, uh mentioned 11 dimensions according to string theory if you read the logical explanation of those dimensions they're really not very intuitive um is my polite way of putting it and i don't think they're super defensible and there's been a lot of valid criticisms on string theory of late um and i was never a fan of it um this was my alternative hypothesis on higher dimensions that said, I want to let Adam go. Um, so go ahead, Adam. So for my comments, centered more around the fourth and fifth dimensional, as you've uh, proposed it, I will say I have yet, I've never heard someone propose that we are fifth dimensional beings. That was an interesting take. And I can see the logical sense behind it, assuming the uh, prepositions you're talking about are correct. I would say though, uh, with the hesitation that time is just linear and it, it cannot be alternate way. I would say there are caveats to that. We've determined that gravity or that mass can warp space time and that time does flow at a different rate around supermassive objects versus empty space. So I would say it's less like a, a, a fall and more like a river. It has a certain flow, a certain speed that you're traveling down that river. And if you can negate that speed for your own momentum, you can either travel slower through the river, or in some cases, compared to an object not traveling at your speed, actually reverse your course up the river and be at two separate places at the equivalent time frame, if that makes any sense. So that is something I, don't, I would think might be an interesting thing to determine once we have a little more technological advancement, because obviously right now we can't get at high enough speeds to even come close to that. That would take at least a 10th C of momentum, but we don't have that. But still an interesting concept. I absolutely love your description of um, rather than a fall, it's more like a flow of a river because um, if I understood you right, it was that you know rivers have faster areas that flow and then they have ebbs and you know who knows, maybe they even have some that go backwards, although I don't think so. But um, I think that there is an arrow of time and everything goes in one direction. But I do think that um, things can dilate um, and we have very good um, evidence that things dilate in time uh, based on subatomic clocks being traveling in planes and um, having time pass at a different rate based on those planes flying. So we have actually observed time travel at, you know, or time flow at a different pace. So I think your description was actually better than mine. So thank you for that. I always appreciate someone that can improve on what I said. Um, and so uh, thank you for that. Great comment. Not a problem. Feel free to use it going forward if you'd like. I 
I will. I will. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll try to add it to the essay and give Adam Butler credit for it. I like to give people credit where it's due because there's not enough of that in the world. So, um, Mike, you have your hand up. Mike Soren. I think as you said that uh, time is, uh, uh, we, we do see things that violate uh, our concept of time, but we're basically uh, uh, driven by our five senses or seven senses, whatever we decide. We, uh, we don't think of, uh, of uh, more of 12 dimensions. However, uh, the world of physics thinks of 12 dimensions. Uh, and we do know that uh, there's relativistic effects, there's entanglement, and there's, uh, and there's quantum tunneling where things appear to appear on the other side of a barrier uh, that uh, they shouldn't, uh, that shouldn't happen. And uh, that's uh, how the devices built that are be that uh, use that fact. Now, uh, physicists have said that time is just a mathematical artifact that prevents everything from go from uh, occurring at one time. And there is some truth to that. And there's some truth to Descartes. How do we know we're not a brain in a jar and we're observing things based on our senses? And uh, it, uh, it, may, it, it may not be reality, but when we go through life, we have a subjective reality that we're bound to that, uh, and uh, that, that illusion of, of causality is one that we have to live to. Uh, if you um, mathematically uh, taking uh, the decision tree thing that, uh, well, that Michael, the other Michael uh, presented earlier, uh, when you do polynomial or multiple regression, you are essentially each variable uh, is, a, is another dimension. And uh, you, uh, you, can, you have uh, say 15 things that something is dependent on and you find the coefficients and that has a mathematical structure of, uh, of dimensions. So uh, uh, th that, uh, that is there. Now, in, in our world, X, Y, Z, and T have uh, another property called orthogonality. Uh, and, uh, and that is that X, Y, and Z are perpendicular to each other. And T, in, in, in its own way, is perpendicular to all, all, four, all three of those. Now, in uh, 12 dimension, you can't really assign meaning in the way we do to the other dimensions and say one of them is this. We, our sensations, our sense world doesn't give them uh, that kind of meaning. So uh, uh, you, there is, uh, there is, they're useful in solving particular problems like, uh, uh, like uh, what, how uh, how quarks and bosons are put together to make uh, electrons, uh, but that's not uh, really uh, the same kind of reality that we see when uh, when we're when we're walking across a river. So uh, uh, that adds a level of complexity. I believe there are more di twelve dimensions. When the, they come up with a model with 25 dimensions, uh, other scientists have been able to reduce them to the 12. There are probably basically 12 dimensions, but they don't necessarily have the physical meaning that we can assign. So I yield the balance of my time, as they say. <laughs> um, I, you might have been over time, Mike. But, um, but yeah, so when you say that things violate the concept of time, what's an example of that? Quantum entanglement uh, violates the speed of light. And there are devices that, uh, uh, that you can build, like uh, when they encrypt something in a satellite, uh, there is a device that you buy that, uh, sends, the, um, uh, that uh, sends the key up into that, uh, that cryptographer key up to the satellite uh, before the actual signal gets there. 
Right. The the um, limitation of the speed is, of light is that physical objects can't travel faster than the speed of light. In the in the case of quantum entanglement, it's it's only potentially information at most, not physical quantities traveling faster than the speed of light. And neither one of them violate the concept of time um, moving in an arrow. Um, Kafui, um, do you want to go next? Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I think um, um, what Mikey says, so an example of what violates the speed of time is photons, right? Photons travel at the speed of light. So in photons world, there's no time. They are just start, they are instantaneous. There's no future, present, and past at all at the same time. So there's no decay of photons and stuff like that. So that's one example of what violates the speed of time. So time doesn't exist in the photonic world, if I want to pull it that way. Well, when you say the, you know, there's no decay. I mean, time time doesn't necessarily imply that everything has to decay, right? Decay is a you know is a an attribute that we see in a lot of things based on time. But there's no there, like when when I'm talking about time, I'm just talking about things passing in time, you know, in one direction. And so for me, violating the concept of time would need to mean that we see something traveling backward in time. And I have read reports of people who claim that um, the arrow of time has been violated. But when I read those reports, um, there's always a weaker link than that the uh, direction of time is being violated. So Mike has his party hat on. Go ahead, Mike. Well, there's probably a, another level beyond where we're able to talk about uh, in this thing, uh, but uh, uh, the, what, uh, what what was was just said is there's a difference between group philosophy and phase philosophy, and there's several other kinds of velocity. And uh, group velocity, when you send a photon, uh, can't uh, can't go faster than the speed of light. But if uh, but through entanglement, through uh, tunneling. Uh, you can you can appear to go faster than the speed of light, and you can actually transmit a you can have a cause that uh, shall we say uh, an effect that comes before the cause. And so, how so if you be? can if you can post an article, um, you know, claiming that an effect comes before the cause, um, those are the types of articles that I've read, Mike, and so far as I can tell, they they um, reject much more likely hypotheses um, in favor of saying that time is going in the opposite direction um, rather than um, than taking the most logical course of action. And I think it makes for good um, good news articles to say that time is traveling backwards or that you know the effect happens before the cause. And it probably gets some scientists funding but I don't think it's the most logical explanation for the evidence that's presented in the articles that I've read. So um, I'm not saying no one's ever claimed that, but I am saying that I don't think that's ever been the most logical explanation for the things that have been observed. Uh, you shouldn't, uh, you can't count on uh, on reversing aging using that technique, but you can, uh, you can count on quantum tunneling to appear instantly across a barrier. So um, and from a practical point of view, it, uh, nothing goes faster than the speed of light. But from a, uh, but in a, uh, uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of quant the quantum world, the, very, the nano world, the very small and likely the very large, uh, and maybe it's done by warping space. So it looks like uh, uh, instantaneously. So it looks like you, you're not passing the, 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 that the distance is zero rather than the time is zero. And Michael M. probably has a similar uh, Brian Green, uh, et cetera. Uh, some of the people have a similar uh, shut up and calculate uh, note that we might have had in, in physics. But uh, there are things that happen that, and I'll 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 find, I'll see if I can research a semi a non mathematical article that talks about this qualitatively. Thank you. No problem. And just so you know, I did do a quick check on ChatGPT, and it it does say that quantum tunneling does not 
um, observe anything faster, traveling faster than the speed of light, or that it violates the principle of causality. Um, so you may you may want to try to post an article that I can read offline, Mike, um, that that says otherwise. Um, so uh, go ahead, because uh, ChatGPT is not always right. I'm very open to it being wrong, but I'd love to read an article that makes those claims along with the evidence that um, it uses to support them. So that said, thanks for your comments, Mike. Um, good to see you. Uh, Constance. Um, yes, I really, really like theory. So I like tonight. Um, thank I see you drinking wine. Um, I, um, the idea that Adam had given earlier about the river, it, from a point of view of overall and not our daily experience, would be, is, good the way that you described it was good for the way that on a daily basis we we see time and observe time here on earth right so i i think both are correct at the same time they are and and um you know like the the reason i chose the option the the description of falling is because you don't fall up, right? Things fall down. And so it shows the arrow of time. The river, you can sort of swim backwards in a river if you swim hard enough and um, the river is not going too fast. Um, and so, but I, I like the idea that it sort of keeps open the possibility of um, time dilation to think of it as a flow and a river with, with different sorts of flow. I think that's a better analogy yes, for okay. near speed of light travel because space time can be bent just not here on yeah on earth i don't think it can be bent yeah we we don't generally but go close you. close to the speed of light on earth but thank you for this very theoretical discussion and sure i am done with my comments um thank you constance michael go ahead Um, have there have there been any experiments that confirm the existence of the fifth and sixth dimension besides the mathematical theories? Um, you mean the ones that I proposed? Or do you mean the ones in string theory? Uh, any actual experiments that has um, has confirmed the existence of the fifth and sixth dimension? Do you mean the fifth, fifth and sixth dimensions that I propose, or the ones that string theory proposes? The one, it doesn't matter. As of okay. right now, for me, so, all of this is theoretical. Yeah. Um. So it's string theory, I would imagine that they have hypotheses and have run experiments on. You know, my my hypothesis is not widely circulated, so I don't think. So let me let me put it this way: like, if my hypothesis is right, you perform such experiments every single day whenever you make any decision, right? You're immediately traveling through the fifth dimension by deciding what you want to eat for breakfast and lunch and dinner. You're always traveling through the fifth dimension by using your free will to decide what you're going to do and what what you're going to intend to do, and so um, the the actual truth is that um, the scientific experiments that also um, support my hypothesis on the fifth dimension are those in quantum mechanics, which says that at the quantum level there are um, uh, random fluctuations that are non-deterministic according to Bell's inequality, unless they are deterministic based on things that are further away than outer space. And like I said, the inverse square fields law basically says that the things that are most impactful in mass energy are the things that are closest to it, um, meaning that they're inversely related to the distance 
So the further the distance away, the less likely it is to have an impact on something. And so the idea that stuff as far away as outer space is impacting deterministically subatomic particles is unfathomable you know, to me. Um, it's just highly indefensible. And then once I wrote my essay on free will, I became you know, very confident that I could say that super determinism was wrong. Um, as far as the sixth dimension, I don't think there is any knowable way to validate or refute the hypothesis I had on the sixth dimension. <laughs> so to be fair, that's why I said it's super theoretical. The fifth dimension, I think we have lots of evidence for. I have a, an essay on free will defending and um, every decision every one of us makes every day validates the fifth dimension and that we're traveling through these parallel possibilities these parallel dimension possibilities, the things that we know are likely possibilities are the ones that we're deciding from, from amongst and we decide which one we want to experience. And the more we try to make one happen, the more likely it is to happen. So um, that that I can answer. I, I haven't looked at the experiments on um, string theory because when I read their explanations of the higher dimensions, it basically seemed like a bunch of nonsense that was just trying to like, um, create explanations that fit their complicated math. And uh, someone another night, I think it was at one of our events, um, maybe it was in a, a group that I'm a part of, but someone basically said how a lot of um, scientists uh, hide behind complex math and try to act like they're right just because they make the math complex enough that no one else can follow it. And I think that's really what string theory is about. And that's why a lot of it has been, you know, largely debunked um, with the predictions that they made not coming true. So, um, you know, I think that it was an explanation of they were the smartest people in the room. And so they got away with coming up with a hypothesis that wasn't really very well defensible, uh, defendable. So um, that said, um, JP Cuddy. Oh, let, let, let me add oh, something. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Do you want to respond oh. to that, Michael? Go ahead. I, I do, yes. Uh, so to me, uh, we often in this these complex maths, we um, hypothesize why we get some of the results we get. Okay. Now that's not a proof. That's a theory. So the only way for me to confirm those hypotheses is to actually have an experiment that confirms it. So my question was not rather a hypothesis in the string theory or anything or any other math, because what you have, your explanation to me doesn't go beyond a simple decision three and you are proposing that you, by making a decision, you're jumping from one dimension to another. Has there been any experiments that show that? Um, so theoretically, if there are parallel dimensions, we don't have any experimental knowledge of them. Um, but um, but we know that there are different possibilities, right? If I go into my breakfast table, I know I could eat Cheerios or cornflakes, right? I know both of those are possibilities. Um, and for me, like it's very much my decision and if my essay on free will which i think you would enjoy quite frankly um and and potentially learn from um if it's right like literally nothing other than god if he's six dimensional knows whether we're gonna choose cornflakes or cheerios assuming that we like both and you know that that we could choose it any given day you know what my daughter wants for breakfast for example i can never figure out what she wants there's certain things she likes more but Every day she picks different stuff and here she is, right? When I'm talking about her. So um, so um, but um if if um Papi tiene mucha gente aquí, no no puedes hablar, mi amor. Busca, busca el iPad. Papi va a hacerlo. So all I'm saying is that um I don't think that like I don't even know if these parallel dimensions um even exist in reality or if it's just hypothetical dimensions that might exist and we there really is only um the one that we experience that comes into existence 
and the past is whatever the past was, and that is set in stone. What I can say with high confidence is that what we're going to experience in the future is non-deterministic and is based on people's free will, including our own. Um, and that said, Mike has so a great add on. So um, you can respond to that quickly and then let, some, let Mike jump in. Right. So the only math that I've seen that actually makes sense is super determinism. Beyond that, everything else is a hypothesis. Super determinism is At also a hypothesis. Um, and it's one, like I said, that is very hard to defend. Um, and again, I think you would benefit from reading my essay on free will because I think it's the final nail in the coffin of super determinism, quite frankly. Um, I'll take a look at that. Okay. Um, uh, Garrett, yeah. um, maybe, yeah. I don't know if you have the essays near, maybe you could post them in chat, free will and yeah. determinism. I'll do that. Um, I think Mike, Mike wants Soren, to go. Yeah, Mike Soren, you wanted to comment on that. Well, uh, you know, Bob, as a, I understand you're a high high level software programmer. You know about uh, how you search a list by a binary search, and that's fast. But uh, a, uh, a hashing algorithm gets you to the uh, point a lot faster. Uh, ChatGPT uses a hashing algorithm that puts the um, uh, each of the board pairs and their relationships and their probabilities in a uh, n-dimensional hypersphere rather than along a straight line. And uh, so it hashes uh, in, uh, to a huge number of word pairs uh, because it operates based on building strings of word pairs and uh, then reassembling them. And uh, you get uh, too many of them to be able to effectively can do them by a binary search or by even a, a linear hashing algorithm. So they put them on an n-dimensional hypersphere and then retrieve them instantaneously mathematically. And Wolfram has a, a, a two-hour video that explains how, how that uh, works in his context. Yeah, I mean, um, everything you said is true, but it's also true that it's a uh, my understanding is that it's also a neural net, um, but it is doing what you're talking about as well. Well, it's not. A, it's, it's a straight. That part of it is a straight mathematical algorithm that puts uh, uh, pairs of words together in probability matrices. So none of this is actually. It's some of this. Some of what you said, I, I have read and I believe in, and I've actually done quite a bit of research in my days at DARPA uh, on. Uh, on on this uh, on the neural nets and some of the inferencing techniques and some of the decisions, but the hashing algorithm it is not a hashing algorithm because you do you can go backwards on neural net. If it was a hashing algorithm, you would not be able to go backwards. So hashing algorithm, the the key the, the what it offers is it's a one directional. Um, a one directional uh, uh, mapping, uh, whereas in in a neural net in ChatGPT, you do actually do you do go backwards in when you are doing regressions and you go back to optimize the coefficients. So, <clears throat> yeah, I, I I still need to get convinced these other dimensions anytime we have these complex maths that we uh, that we elaborate on we come up with these hypotheses that needs to be tested and it needs to be shown and proved and i haven't seen any of that yeah the, and i, the I don't believe is, uh... chat gpt actually does talk about the additional dimensions when you say the additional dimensions you mean uh, string theory no, that I was talking about the uh, the no, the Chat GPT. I think the gentleman mentioned uh, multi dimensions within the Chat GPT as it how it groups. And I look at I of the words that have similar meanings. I look at that as somewhat a nearest neighbor algorithm, which basically it gets to choose a word, the proper word within that group that it wants to select, and randomly depending on 
uh, they, they uh, what was it they were calling it, the thermal coefficient or, um, to, so depending on that, they introduce an element of randomness and based on that, they decide which algorithm decides randomly within that nearest neighbor, which word is going to choose for, uh, for its forecast. But nowhere I have seen, I would really like to hear where does it even brings up the subject of multi dimensions within the chat GPT. That would be very interesting to know. Yeah, if you have an article for that, uh, Mike, go ahead and post it. I know uh, I haven't heard that before either. I do know that it's a neural net, but I, I had not heard that it um, uses a multi dimensional hashing function, although it wouldn't surprise me. Hashes are great at efficiency, like you said, Mike. So um i i love hash <laughs> i love hashing stuff so um that said um let's let jp uh cutty go next i have a question garrett yeah about your thought experiment but i need to understand two points i don't need them re-explain just if i understood you described a line as an infinite number of points and each point is only one thing it's a this or that correct right Okay, so a plane would be the same kind of thing. It's all these parallel parallel lines, but each line itself is still just going to be an infinite number of points, meaning one thing or another, correct? Um, an infinite number of combinations of where there is something and isn't something at different points in the line. And so like there, there's probably one line where it's all points, and there's another line where there's no points, and then there's everything in between. Okay. You also said to, exp to explain the expanding idea of dimensions, you could take the third dimension, three dimensions, and collapse them down to a plane, and then put slides of planes next to each other to explain the next dimension, correct? So just to be clear, when I say you collapse it down, you're not losing any of the information. We're only collapsing it down for the visualization purposes. All the other dimensions are still in there. They're still, the data is still there. The existence and non-existence is still there, but we're collapsing them down to visualize what would a parallel dimension look like in that scenario. Is that is that clear? Yes, but even if it's only a visualization now, once I take three dimensions and collapse it down to two dimensions, that line is collapsed down to its own, every one of those lines is collapsed down to a point. Having more than just an either or. No, I mean, no, that's what I'm saying is like. Um, if we collapse, if we visualize collapsing it down to experiment or to experience these other slide dimensions on the sides. Can I just take all those dimensions on the sides, say now that's a third dimension, collapse that down again to a second dimension, keep doing this odd infinitum and keep saying, well, there's multiple infinite. Multiple no, no. So dimensions going on and on, and keep collapsing down. Yeah, I, I get why you would say that. Um, and this is part of um, what I learned how to do in linear algebra is how you you can collapse things down without losing the information. You're collapsing them down for visualization purposes only. So when I collapse three dimensional space down to two dimensional space, it's not that information is lost. Like we have the exact same number of infinite lines. We have the exact same number of spaces on those lines. It's just that we're not going to pay attention to a little bit of that data for visualization reasons. We're going to pay attention to something new, which is now going to be the Z axis going up and down. And we're going to pretend that we understand that, you know, a line is all of three dimensional space, for example, um, and that you know, in parallel to a line that's all of three dimensional space for all of time, you know, a parallel line is a whole nother version of three dimensional space in parallel. And that whole three dimensional space still exists. And if you look at that line, it's, it's all there. It, you know, we're not losing data or information. We're just doing it for visualization purposes, because as five dimensional beings, we can really only conceive of three dimensions. Like that's all we observe is three dimensions. And we observe three dimensions over time so we can conceive of time. And so we can kind of conceive of four dimensions. We can conceive of three dimensions and time passing, but we can't visualize four dimensions. Try to draw a four dimensional sphere. I mean, there are, there are like attempts to do it, but it's really three dimensional interpretations of a four dimensional thing. And so the only way we can really understand four dimensions is to collapse three dimensions down to two, and then look at 
the Z axis as being the fourth dimension. Does that make sense? It does. All I'm asking is the question I've seen before is once we're able to take a fourth, a third dimension and make it a second dimension so that we could then recreate this extra third dimension again. So we say that's the fourth dimension if we understand it. Every time I do that, I've now created a new third dimension, even though one of those dimensions is is collapsed down. Extra, right? So this plane is really my three dimensions. I've just collapsed it down to explain the fourth dimension now coming off of the z-axis. Every time I do that, I can keep collapsing that extra dimension down. This third dimension becomes a second dimension that I create a third dimension, which is actually fourth dimension, but I'm now trying to visualize fourth dimension by making the third dimension the second. Fourth dimension comes down to a third. I can do that again. Take that third dimension down the, to second dimension. The thing is, and yeah, the thing is like these these dimensions like represent real things and we have to be able to conceive of the higher dimension and the highest one that I can conceive of and I'm pretty good at abstract thought is six dimensions like after the sixth dimension like you know I got nothing you know like after you know losing cause and effect like cause and effect is so fundamental I can't imagine any scenario like I don't think there has been ever an observed scenario where cause and effect was not in play I think everything is cause and effect that we observe everything about the physical universe, the, you know, knowledge, wisdom, like everything we can conceive of is about cause and effect. And so for me, the sixth dimension is no longer assuming cause and effect. Now, what even a parallel thing to cause and effect looks like, I don't even know. And so sure, theoretically, mathematically, you could keep you know, collapsing down over and over again infinitely. And that's what the string theory people do to get 12 dimensions. But it's all nonsense, right? They can't they can't describe in logic a logical way what any of those dimensions really mean. They can't even describe the fifth and sixth dimensions logically. I at least got those. Um, but they can't conceive of like what those dimensions mean logically at all. Does that make sense? Where like like mathematically you're right, you can keep collapsing infinitely but it's not meaningful if it doesn't mean anything. I think the best thing you're saying there is we could do it an amount of times as we want to, but once we lose the meaning, it doesn't mean anything. I agree. And that's why I say the sixth dimension isn't very meaningful, right? Because you know, up to the fifth dimension, it is meaningful, right? Like to understand that, that the fifth dimension is free will would be innovative. Like if that's true, it's innovative. Um, and to understand that um, our free will is what helps us navigate the many worlds that um, the many worlds hypothesis agrees with would be innovative. Now, if those things are true, they're innovative and they're they're potentially adding some value to, to people's lives. Um, you know, time will tell whether or not they're true and whether or not that's right. But um, that's what I'm putting out into the universe. So that said, Mike had his party hat on. What did you want to say, Mike? Uh, put the uh, a link uh, in there, but uh, this is very abstract as to how you use this. Uh, our minds, like uh, there is a book called Flatland that says uh, it, uh, somebody who lives in Flatland can't visualize three dimensions. It's totally counterintuitive, but you can use, uh, uh, if you lived in Flatland, you can make use of uh, of a three of up and down, even though it doesn't, uh, you it, it's not intuitive. And similarly, we can make use of higher dimensions and uh, you calculate uh, everything we want to know about it uh, by br bringing it back to the uh, uh, to our three dimensional or whatever we co want to call our world. Uh, but uh, there's no way that our mind can uh, visualize it. And uh, that, that article that I produced uh, has to do with uh, uh, the interaction between uh, magnetic uh, uh, magnetic field in semiconductors uh, with um, and lasers with uh, um, and with uh, uh, pumping with a pump, uh, and which is a fairly abstract thing, but it, it it's there and you can do things with it. But uh, the, you're not going to be able to uh, to do anything with it. Just like you're not going to be able to 
visualize it just like you can't visualize a maybe a strip or uh, as uh, of the universe or a whole list of other things you can't I can't visualize and you mentioned uh, you mentioned Bell's theorem that's uh, in the same league Bell's theorem says you can't do this the way but he didn't really say you can't do this he can't do this the way people have been trying to do that and uh, I think that's what the other Michael uh, may have alluded to in uh, some of his comments. Yeah, my Bell, uh, Bell's inequality is not uh, is, is just saying that uh, uh, that that special case he investigated is false. So maybe. Um... I'm going to let uh, DLJ uh, go next, and I'll I'll try to read your essay. Um, I tried to skim it, um, Mike, but it's not skimming material, um, although I was a little bit perplexed that when they say a two-dimensional electron gas, because two dimensions, like, is not physical. Like, there is no such thing as a two-dimensional gas. All gas is three-dimensional, so um, I don't know what they mean by a two-dimensional elect electron gas. Um, uh don't feel bad about it. I don't understand it either, even though well, I can understand the notation. This is this is where I'm saying, Mike, sometimes people want to be the smartest, the smartest person in the room. And by saying stuff that makes no sense, they try to trick people into thinking they have something innovative. And I really like Einstein's quote, which is, if you can't explain it to a six-year-old child, you don't understand it well enough. And I think I can explain just about anything I know to my six-year-old kids. And there's lots of stuff I don't know, and there's lots of stuff that I'm still learning. But I, I think we, we should be able to explain things in simple terms that will help anyone understand it. Or we just, quite frankly, either don't know what we're talking about or don't understand it well enough. Um, and again, not, not that you're going to explain all the nuance, right? But you know, I got my kids like quantum physics for babies, like when they were kids. So like, you know, everything is like in some way or shape or form explainable in a simplified way if you understand it well enough. So it got published in Nature. It's a it's a refereed paper and uh, some really smart people. Yeah, <laughs> smarter, a lot smarter than me. Refereed it. They uh, people uh, the people who wrote it may not have been smart, but the people who refereed it are probably smarter, a lot smarter than me. Oh, it's very possible that the people who wrote it were smarter than the people who refereed it. So that said, um, DLJ, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Sound okay? You can hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Excellent. Um, yeah, this is the downside of the party hat. While you're waiting in the queue, people are in, interjecting with things that you were going to say. So, um, yeah. Um, Fun thought experiment. I admire you for putting it down on paper and getting it challenged. Reminds I'm having flashbacks to my 12 year old self when the maths teacher, RIP, my favorite teacher, uh, introduced the idea of what's it like if you're on a one dimension and a two dimensional being comes into your world and he was essentially explaining flatland. And we all went, Ooh, so we were going, Oh, ghosts. That's what ghosts are. But we're 12. <laughs> and then the, the following week, of course, he comes in and he says, Right, I'm going to teach him some physics, and this is why ghosts don't exist. So that's uh, a lesson, lesson learned in theory versus practical. Um, so a suggestion, first of all, on the paper, I think it is a good idea to give a definition of dimension um, by saying you're kind of defining dimension by each dimension that you're describing means that you you don't have a meta category or meta label. I mean, dimension could be a different thing each time, right? So I think Mike's suggestion of using variables or variables that we can move along or through or basically variables might be a better idea because you you at the beginning of the talk you said um infinite in length for all dimensions so that implies length implying therefore time is not a dimension so you kind of have to pick i think you have to pick some definition of dimension is, is a suggestion there um the paper on um libertarian free will mainly for michael's benefit because he's going to review it um as you know, I've had a look at it. I think it is a good argument against hard determinism, but I don't think you've made the case against super determinism that Michael was talking about or compatibilism or soft determinism. So you've kind of got a non sequitur by saying it's not hard determinism, therefore it is libertarian free, free will. So I see, I see that as a non sequitur. Um, if you can make the case against super determinism and soft determinism, I'm, I'm going to be on board. Right? Um, 
I'm okay with free will, by the way, but in a different sense. Um, so that now the main point I wanted to make, I haven't run out of time. Oh, yeah. So this is about moving. All oh, right. So this is about whether you're stating that when you make a selection as to which breakfast cereal, right, you're create you're choosing from op different futures. This is quite quantum physics. I like this. It's kind of you know reducing the um, probability field, whatever. Um, collapsing so so choice collapses the uh <clears throat> the future options that's a kind of quantum physics thing so uh, yeah okay are you saying that those other potential futures which are now pasts once you've chosen them are real and tangible and therefore you can move between them which means implying that you could if you can do time travel jump between different futures and pasts as well if you've got these different dimensions if so, that's unfalsifiable, which was the point about there's no practical experiment for this. So great to take it on, but I currently not seeing anything. It's currently unfalsifiable. So great as a thought experiment, but uh, I don't. I'm not sure how much further we can go from that. Anyway, that, that Wait, what, what was unfalsifiable? Say it again. You reminded if, me of something if, else that I forgot to mention, so I was taking yeah. a note of that. So if you're arguing that we're making with the like whatever being is making a choice between going left or right or choosing which breakfast cereal to have, right? If we are creating or selecting from these other futures, uh, therefore, once we make that decision, we're creating an alternative past. Is that past a tangible thing? Because you're implying that you can move between them if there's the different dimensions, right? So if it is a tangible thing, then what's the experiment for that? As Michael was saying, it's it's unfalsifiable. There's, there's, no, there's no practical experiment that I can imagine because I'm not very intelligent, obviously, so my brain doesn't work well enough on that. So um, it's like, yeah, so you've got an unfalsifiable hypothesis, which is the snag. But uh, No, it, that, it is, it is falsifiable. Work. I'll explain to you. It's not right now, but um, I'll explain to you. And you are smart, so you'll understand what, I, what I'm saying. Um, a couple of things, because uh, you, you covered a bunch of topics. So one is that Flatland, uh, when one of my friends read my essay, he told me to read Flatland. So I read it. Um, and that's the closest thing I've seen to my essay. Um, and as far as the suggestion of giving a definition of the dimension, I, you know, I can try to do it. Um, like, I guess, um, you know, I did, I did try to do it in the presentation in saying that it is a, you know, each dimension that go like each n plus one dimension is a parallel but slightly different version of the n minus one dimension um and so um it becomes more tangible at three dimensions um because that's what we observe and so um i think it, it is a good suggestion i'll try to noodle on if there's a way that i can come up with a tangible um yeah. definition of what a dimension is um but it is a little hard to encapsulate both space and time and higher dimensions I agree. With, yeah, uh, exactly. you know consistent definition without being so abstract that it's kind of useless and so the the description of the dimensions was the best way that i do it but then again i tend to dive into the details and then come up for water and describe what i came up with afterwards so um i think it's a good suggestion as far as the essay on free will i do think it does make a good case against super determinism and soft determinism so i would encourage you to try to ask me questions um, or like come up with some reason that um, you know I essentially proved that determinism itself is wrong and soft determinism is still determinism um, yeah. which is that there's only one possible future and well, I that's, basically made that's, the argument the that problem. there is not only one possible future that there are multiple possible futures at any given moment in time. And then in fact, the, the natural laws, which is what determinism says, determine the future solely are not like, are not possible to be the only um, future uh, determinant, because if that were the case, it would be consistent and complete, which Gerdel's incompleteness theorem says that no system is consistent right. and complete. So um, I think I it's actually- you you can't sorry to interrupt but you you can have multiple possible futures with soft determinism so that's why you haven't negated that one yet with hard determinism so you would have to you would have to post a source um you know saying that because that's actually the very definition of libertarian free will 
No, well, compatibilism, right? So you can have a determinist. No, I, I know, I know what yeah. compatibilism is, and the very definition of compatibilism is that there's only one possible future. No, is no. that the laws of the laws Choose. of physics or the natural laws is what they say in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy is the sole determinant of the future. Now, if you can error, if you can error. post a scholarly article saying that soft determinism says that there are multiple possible futures, then I'm happy to use that terminology no. going forward, but I haven't seen one. Yeah, no, I think there's a there's a conflation with b between determinism and predeterminism. I think that's might be the error. But anyway, I've I've taken up enough time. Ginny, I hand over to you. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Ginny, go ahead. Um this discussion oh, of fifth dimensionalism. Ginny, Ginny I yeah. apologize. There was one other thing that was important that um, DLJ brought, brought to my mind that I wanted to bring up is time travel. Um, so as far as the falsifiable um, uh, problem, and you're not going to like this DLJ, it's not going to feel very satisfying, but um, I actually uh, you know, came up with a hypothesis of how time travel could be theoretically possible um, without um without uh what's it called uh a paradox and this is the falsifiable experiment is if you went back in time and killed your own grandparent right the paradox goes if you went back in time and killed your own grandparent then how could you possibly exist so it must be impossible you know you can't go back in time and kill your own grandparent however what i would argue is if these multiple dimensions are, you know, actually existing, then in theory, you could go back in time in another parallel universe, kill your grandparent, and in that parallel universe, you never actually come to fruition, but the you from the parallel universe, which was able to travel parallel universes, is present in that parallel universe. So theoretically, if it's possible to travel parallel universes, you could, you know, create a falsifiable experiment where you travel to a past that never existed in the past that you've experienced. And that that is theoretically possible in a many worlds scenario where traveling amongst the different parallel universes is possible. So not very satisfying for you, I know, but nonetheless, um, if time travel does become possible, I was working on equations on that in college. Um, I think I had a good start, but who knows? Um, and um, I don't have time to go back to my uh, college textbooks and debt them with, uh, you know, people with with the math that I had back then that I don't have anymore. So that said, I'm going to let uh, Ginny go next. Um, yeah, uh, this topic, although it's very interesting, and it's slightly above my head, fifth dimensionalism, sixth dimension, and string theory and all of that. But when it comes to something that I can relate to, uh, cherry of versus frosted flakes or whatever, um, I maybe a better choice might be broccoli versus kale or something. Sorry, yeah, Garrett, I'm being silly and and trying I to be. Agree. A... We should talk about healthy vegetables, Jenny. I, yeah, I yeah, especially I if there you are, you are children in the meeting. No, I'm just I kidding object. again. I know. Give me frosted. Yeah. What's that? I said, I object. Give me Frosties any day. I have a kale. <laughs> <laughs> there, see, my, there you go. My daughter That's... is a Cinnamon Toast Crunch fan, so she likes the sweet stuff, and she's very picky, so I just feed it to her because at least she'll eat that. So <laughs> this, this one is actually a good eater, right, Amiya? You're done it's with very, it. uh, uh, And very beautiful. Okay. Thank you. Well, I, I'm trying to be a comic relief, but I guess I didn't succeed. You did succeed. Oh, my, you have to. You you have two beautiful daughters there. Thank you. Yes, as always. Hello, daughters. Mm -hmm. I want to just add magic. Uh, yeah. This is mm. just add magic. Mm. Yeah, so mm. It's so cool, Daddy. Good to see you. I don't know. You have to ask mommy this. Ask mommy. Is she sleeping? Can you turn this off and then when you do it? Yeah, we can do it another day. No. But I no. I don't know. You're gonna have to ask mommy this. I don't know the pin. Puppy no pay you that. No way. I'm sorry, Garrett. What language are you speaking there? 
Um, I mean, I was speaking English for a second, but then I went to Spanish. So I normally speak Spanish to them. Huh. Oh, that's interesting. But I was speaking English for a minute. So, <laughs> so maybe that confused you because you're used to me speaking to them in English. So uh, or in Spanish. So Ellis, go ahead. I was going to say, um, if anyone wants to raise their hand, now would be a good time. Uh, and also, um, I think there's a dinner coming up on the 29th, was it? Uh, mm -hmm. So if there's anyone in New York uh, that would like to meet Garrett and um, enjoy a nice uh, meal uh, that's happening. Um, and I think upcoming, uh, we're going to have some critical thinking um, events. So you all can look out for that. We are. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, I'm going to actually. Oh, and another thing. Um, uh, maybe you could talk uh, a little bit about um, membership. Uh, I'll post the, the link. Um, and also, if anybody would like to hop in and uh, let us know any topics they want to see in the future, you're welcome to tell us that as well so that I, we can uh, create that for you. Let me give a quick preview into the critical thinking. This is going to be much more practical than tonight. Um, so I'm going to cover um, in a variety of uh, events. We're going to start with research or information literacy, um, the two together. And then we're going to talk about evidence evaluation, how you can take the things that you research and the information you gather and vet it for, uh, for whether or not it's useful. And then we're going to talk about formal logic and how to use that to create 100% you know, accurate, uh, given your assumptions, um, conclusions. And then we're going to talk about types of bias that we should be aware of, which um, some types of bias um, will uh, we need to realize will steer us in the wrong direction that's falling off this cliff some types of inference will create wrong conclusions and that's falling off this cliff and fallacies will always create wrong conclusions that's falling off this cliff where they're coming with coming up with bad um you know bad conclusions and then the ones that come up with good conclusions teach us about our knowledge of objective reality which then is used as a foundation for creating wisdom and I would argue wisdom is um, the ability to make decisions that A, prevent significant unnecessary harm, and I'll go into what that means, and then B, after we've prevented significant unnecessary harm for all human beings, and ideally um, sentient beings uh, at some point, but um, more importantly for human beings, um, then we should increase happiness and decrease harm for the people that we can influence. Um, and so this is ultimately what the next, um, you know, series of uh, conversations are going to be about. So for anyone interested in that, please come to the uh, the series on critical thinking. It's near and dear to me. I think it's what is needed most in this world is to help uh, people with critical thinking skills. And I think there are a lot of people here that can add value to um, the lectures and augment them with their own opinions and ideas as people have been doing tonight. And so I really welcome uh, people's contributions to those. If anyone wants to collaborate on any of these, feel free to reach out to me as well um, if those topics interest you and you have uh, any interest in uh, collaborating. So that said, um, what other anyone, if anyone has other questions on dimensions, we're happy to take questions. If not, it seems like there's a lot of interest in free will. We could talk about free will as well, although. It's 820, so I can't go through the whole argument um, defending free will, but I could go through a Cliff's Notes version of it um, if people want to talk about that. It seems to be a very popular topic. Um, uh, yeah. Garrett, did you want to talk about the membership a bit too? Oh yeah, thanks, Ellis. So um, you know, let me let me pull up the membership document so that I can uh... see me more. It's free at this time. So if anyone would like to join, um, you know, smaller group discussions sí. um, and make friends, es que it's a good way. She doesn't know. Like, like sing. Daddy doesn't know either. I'll have to look at it tomorrow. No puedo hacerlo en medio. No, no puedo. No puedo. Um, Mi amor. Mi amor. Uh, papi, okay. papi tiene mucha gente esperándole. Papi tiene mucha gente esperándole. No puedo, mi amor. No puedo. Te amo. No podemos. No, no funciona. 
Mañana te puedo ayudar. Mañana. Mi amor, mañana. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so um, let me talk a little bit. Alia, Alia, déjame. That's okay. That's okay. Mi Some amor. of us have raised our children and we miss those times. I know. I do. I, I actually, I'm absolutely loving it, but it's a little hard when you <laughs> when you have almost 20 people waiting for you on a Zoom and she just <laughs> wants my attention. Lo siento, mi amor. Mi amor, hay 20 personas esperándome. Yeah. Okay, so let me explain um, the goals. Alia, Alia, de veras, para Tú puedes ir a la tele. Puedes ir a la tele. No, no puedes. Bueno, te puedo poner um, en YouTube. Women don't take no for an answer. No. That is pretty much how it's going. <laughs> so, no puedo, no puedo. So is that the, um, uh, in the, sorry, I got a notice. Uh, is that the NYU library in your background? No, it's actually Cornell's oldest library. Um, I'm a Cornell. Oh, that's guy. right. That's right. Um, yeah, but, but yeah. Um, I think that it was modeled after um, the one in, uh, what is it? Trinity Library, which is where the Harry Potter library is based on. So, momentito, mi amor. Papi está haciendo. ¿Qué quieres ver? El video. I'm running out of charge again. Um, no, these are all just. You wanted to see octopus. No. What do you want to see? Rapido, rapido. Mm, octopus. Come. Okay, so the FTI membership is about, um, you know, increasing happiness and decreasing harm for uh, people that members can influence, and then um, helping each other earn enough money that money no longer buys happiness, or really, um, in the US, that's about $95,000 USD a year. Although ideally, we would want to get to enough money that we can retire making that um, just on investment income alone. Um, and um, that should be very doable depending on where you're starting off. And then um, we want to engage with diverse opinions in a polite form where we can learn from each other and um, help each other achieve life goals, which is um, you know, um, a, a way of enabling each other to make more prosperous and balanced choices and acquire knowledge and wisdom. And we really wanna create like a, a community of friends that help each other be the best version of ourselves, seek truth and be fair. And um, if having friends that will help you be the best version of yourself, help you seek truth and help you be fair, um, sounds appealing, then membership may be a good thing for you. Right now there's no fee for membership. Um, there may be at some point, um, there's a separate members curriculum, which members get access to um that um is a series of videos teaching things like how to achieve your life's goals in a state of flow uh how to give and receive feedback because that's part of um you know having a gross my mi growth mindset and um you know there are other um there are other benefits to membership as well so um for those looking to be a part of a community that helps you be the best version of yourself seek truth and be fair um i would love for you to uh look into membership and apply and um, and Mike has his hand up, so I'm going to let him go. Let me ask about new uh, about possible topics. This topic of how we view uh, n dimensions or uh, abstract concepts is kind of what the what has been called an emergent property. Uh, there's a there's something uh, out there uh, called the Game of Life by Conway that talks about really simple rules give emergent properties uh, that uh, and e even consciousness and the forecasting and the kinds of and free will is an emergent property. I'm not sure that um, uh, as something happened to civilization uh, 20,000 years ago when people started to stop becoming a hunter-gatherer group 
that uh, led to a, a mushrooming of uh, an, an exponential growth of uh, civilization and knowledge. Uh, and uh, that uh, was an emergent property uh, of, um, of, a, uh, of, of some very simple decision rules. And that's what's uh, going on in uh, certain kinds of artificial intelligence, like genetic algorithms and that sort of thing. And uh, that's um, uh, it, it, it. It appears that how we uh, throw rocks to hit things, which uh, uh, which uh, and be able to comp to calculate those kind of complicated equations to decide where that rock is going to hit. Uh, didn't occur uh, to uh, uh, prehistoric uh, man and to animals. And so at a certain critical level of complexity, emergent properties that weren't uh, expected appear. And there, there is some relatively uh, intuitive literature on that sort of thing that uh, uh, I think if you gave that the same kind of treatment you gave to this subject to that, that would interest a lot of us. We, I didn't understand what, what the request was. Say it again, or you mean about emergent properties? Uh, reframe uh, and tie together uh, this discussion and consciousness uh, as emergent properties of, uh, of, our, of our intellect. So, um, yes, I think so. I think consciousness would be a great topic for another night. Um, so let's definitely do that. We actually had a panel on consciousness where I had a couple of other speakers share their perspectives and I shared mine, but I only shared mine in a small portion of the time. I wanted to give more of the time to the other speakers, but um, I think um, consciousness is a good one um, that I can add value on. I will, I will tell you, Mike, that you may not, you may not agree with me because um, emergent property is, you know, what I think scientists give the name to of things that they can't explain and they want to keep boxed within the realm of science. It's basically a way to be the smartest person in the room and say, I understand that. It's simply an emergent property. <clears throat> you know, like, here's my PhD and this is an emergent property. Well, emergent uh, property yeah. really just means we don't really understand it. It doesn't fit in our box, but we're going to put it in our box and call it an emergent property. Um, for those not familiar, emergent property just means out of a system of things, an emergent property is something that arises from that system of things without any like good explanation of how it comes about. It's just so complex that we don't understand it, which is why what I'm saying is not actually, um, I don't even, I mean, I'm, I'm basically saying that politically incorrect uh, definition of emergent property, but if you read the politically correct definition and have mine in the back of your mind, I think you'll see that it actually resonates. So uh, that said, um, I, yeah, I think have you, consciousness would be great, um, Mike, uh, and we should talk yeah, about that. I said I was in on the, the your discussion of consciousness, and you've discussed it in some of your all, uh, older uh, philosophy groups that you ran a few years ago, uh, but uh, and and free will. Uh, but the uh, uh, Conway's paper and Conway's uh, simple computer program. Uh, does get uh, does try to give um, uh, doesn't just say it's too complicated to understand. Uh, they're saying how how uh, how this occurred by just complexity alone. That uh, as kind of a local property of shall we say entropy. That even things that go, that tend to uh, disorder tend to create local pockets of real order. Got it. Is that Ann Conway? I don't remember. Um, the, there's some knowing looks that people have read Conway's paper on uh, the game of life. Google game of life, which I'm trying to do now, but my system isn't smart enough, isn't fast enough. Got it. Um, if you have the paper, could you send it to me, Mike? I'll try and post it to here. Or I'll post it on Discord later. That'd be awesome. Thanks so much, my friend. Um, Kafui, you wanted you had your party hat on. Yeah, just want to make a quick comment on uh, on on the dimension. So I think I agree with you on 
sometimes when science reach a, a, a roadblock, they, they, they begin to theorize and make things extremely complicated instead of just saying that, hey, we don't know what's going on here and we are Philosophers stuck. Philosophers do that too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> But but I, I think sometimes we also, you know, the consumers of those theories, sometimes we also become to believe everything they say. For example, you know, the Big Bang. Most people think it's a, it's a proof or it's a fact. It's just a theory, right? The, I mean, right now we are learning that, you know, there are some galaxies that are way older than they need to be in, in like, I think 100 million years, they don't need to be as big as what they are. So those theories are also being in bank. So I think science, I think I agree with you. We have to be very skeptical about science as well. We don't just accept things because somebody, you know, from, you know, PhD or say things that complex yeah. the masses. So I think I agree with you. But my then, question to you is that, are you saying that free will is another dimension or another, another dimension? So you are equating feel free will after time? So yes, I, I think that not only free will, but parallel um, sets of laws of physics are okay. the fifth dimension. Um, and um, and that's, you know, the dimension higher than time. Okay. Um, so and by the way, um, you, you may enjoy, if you wanna reach out to me on Discord or on email, um, I'll put my email in the chat. Um, if you reach out to me, I can get you the video for um, my uh, uh, presentation on the origins of the universe, where I basically argue that the Big Bang was not the beginning of time. Um, yeah. If you read scientists' explanation for what existed before the Big Bang and how long it existed, you'll realize that it really is kind of nonsense. Um, yeah. And so I have a much better explanation, I okay, think, yeah. for um, the origins of the universe, quote unquote, because I think it's eternal. But um, I have a good explanation for how it's eternal and cyclical. Um, and and by the way, what you were talking about, about like, don't you believe someone just because they're a PhD is actually, um, there's a logical fallacy called an appeal to authority, which is yep. just because someone's an authority, we're yep. going to trust yep. them with blind <laughs> exactly. faith. And we have to all remember that just because someone's a PhD doesn't mean they definitely know what they're talking about. PhDs make mistakes too. They're still human. So um, we all are. Even, even even it doesn't just apply to PhD expert people who call themselves so called experts you know we we kind of default to experts so he must or she must know everything so even you know in most fields most of the innovation don't come from those experts they come from some somebody who is not even in those fields so that should tell us that hey experts <laughs> don't know it all so <laughs> all right thanks thank you um, Adam go ahead. So uh, Mike actually, in his uh, comment, reminded me of an interesting sort of an alternative theory that I heard about the explanation of where agriculture came from, where society evolved from, and explaining the vast difference between our initial evolutionary appearance and then our cult or civilization appearance. And it was interesting because there's a few things I've seen in history that might show a possibility for it. Uh, the theory is that this is actually not the first civilizational uh, arisal to happen in our history, and that over a couple different time frames of 100,000 years, we've had civilization rise, peak, fall, stagnate, rise, peak, fall, stagnate again and again. And something that I've seen that actually makes me think that could possibly be a, be a thing is an example of what we did to some of our larger monuments over the past 2000 years. Look at the pyramids. The pyramids were an ancient structure the Egyptians built. And when they were first built, they were encased in this white marble stone and were a vast difference than what they are today. And over a relatively short amount of time in terms of a species or a culture, they were stripped of resources by, for necessities need. So realistically people would go and they would take blocks from the pyramids or the Colosseum of Rome and use them as building material to help their life at that point, not having any sort of respect for what it meant in the culture. And if you break that down over a long enough period, especially with survival being paramount over anything else as it is in human society, it would explain a lack of any history past a certain point. So it's an interesting concept. I don't know for sure whether it's plausible, but it's it's definitely kind of something outside the realm of what's accepted. 
but it kind of makes a twisted sort of sense just because fiction is rarely stranger than proof. Yeah, so I've hypothesized that. In fact, um, for those that are Lord of the Rings fans, that's the hypothesis of Lord of the Rings is that um, the story of Lord of the Rings is supposed to be a precursor to European um, history where the time of the Lord of the Rings was actually before modern European history. Um, that was what Tolkien envisioned um, and that was his original topic. The thing is, um, Adam, um, I guess uh, like, we don't have any um, archaeological evidence that indicates that these past great civilizations existed. So, um, you know, I think, um, like, my guess is that they probably didn't. Um, but, you know, who knows, right? Like, like, theoretically, they could have. Uh, but, um, yeah. It's an interesting thought experiment. Like I said, there's no, as you mentioned, there's no proof. We we cannot prove one way or the other. So it's just an interesting thing of, hey, you know, what if that could be it? Well, I, I think there is, there is a lot of archaeological, global archaeological evidence that shows that, you know, shows what, what um, uh, the evolution of life on earth has looked like, you know, back to, you know, very long distances in time. And so, we we do have evidence for it now maybe all our evidence is wrong and some omnipotent god is cleverly hiding past civilizations that's hypothetically possible but very unlikely to be true um because what motive would they have to do that um but anyway shaunik has his hand up his uh, party hat on so i'm going to let him comment no i'm just thinking adam you might be talking about some something related to the younger dryas uh uh, incident right it's just so one thing you i don't know if it's a theory and some people call it a conspiracy theory or whatnot but it is true that there is not strong evidence for past you know civilizations like that but you know one thing that there's in literature you'll see many civilizations always have that flood myth it's you know they have the epic flood myth in many 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 cultures uh, which indicates that, you know, there was a civilization one time before and it got destroyed and whatnot. And it is true that, you know, some 12,000 years ago or something like that, there was a massive cataclysmic, uh, you know, uh, event that uh, destroyed a lot of stuff. I don't know if that necessarily destroys all the archaeological evidence that might be there, but uh, it's a theory that's out there that I think that the one that you're pointing to, Adam, uh, some archaeologists say that, you know, there's, professional archaeologists say that there's no evidence, but other amateur archaeologists, you know, I'm forgetting the name of this guy, uh, or some people call him a conspiracy theorist, they try to put forward that, you know, those kind of events did happen. Uh, and, you know, it's something like the say, uh, pyramids, it's, it's, it's like, it's non-explainable given the tools and features that they had at that time, how did they actually made it? Is, is that something similar to what you're referring to, Adam? Slightly, but also looking at from the point of comparing human behavior in the past 2000 years and basically correlating that human, human behavior does not really change much over a long period of time. True. So if you have a collapse of a large society, let's take Rome. Rome is a wonderful example. After the fall of the Roman Empire, the Colosseum famously became used as a quarry for stone and other materials and was slowly deconstructed to its current state because it was easier to take the material that had already been produced, quarried, and styled to produce local buildings than it was to go and gather it again. So my theory is more that if this is true, again, I'm not proposing that it is, it's more of an interesting thought experiment. It would also be interesting because when you look at how humanity operates in a survival situation or when there is a loss of a overarching civiliz civilization, it would explain a lack of archaeological remnants, mainly because they were constantly being repurposed to continue life as it exists at the moment. I theorize something similar would happen if we had a mass civilization collapse today, a place like New York, all the steel, glass, and concrete would eventually be taken and utilized for other buildings, other purposes over the course of a thousand years. 
because it's more readily available there than it is to reproduce. And thus, it's easier to take than make. But to your point, that is another theory I've heard, and it's just, it's a fun thought experiment. It's kind of a, it's a fun idea of, hey, you know, maybe this is it. We don't really know. There's no way, really way to prove it, but it's kind of interesting. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I'm just reading um, the quote that, uh, what, was, what was your name? Deborah um, posted, and if you don't mind, Michael, I'm going to take a second to just um, digress a little bit. Um, Deborah posted a quote, which actually is very fascinating. The level of wisdom from the Buddha is just never ceases to amaze me. And he, he talks about how um, the, um, the world contracts um, at different times and, um, and then life expands for a long period of time and that, um, you know, um, it, I guess, um, you know, if you look at my hypothesis on the origins of the universe, it's essentially that there's an infinite number of big bangs, which, if that's true, kind of actually aligns with the Buddhist wisdom, which is that um, the universe, um, you know, contracts to a small, you know, infinitesimally small point, not infinitesimally, but extremely small point, and then expands. In other words, as Deborah was describing, it breathes, you know, breathes life into the universe. And that corner of the universe then breeds life of many varieties. And then um, eventually the edges of that universe collide with the edges of other um, big bangs. And it's not of the universe, but it's the edges of that um, expansion. Or it's not even an expansion. It's just an explosion of mass energy. And it collides with the uh, mass energy of other explosions, you know, of other basically big bangs that happen throughout the universe. And they form massive black holes, which then you know, contract and then expand again. And so the idea of breathing, you know, it's kind of like these black holes and um, uh, explosions are like breathing of the universe, which then breathes life into the universe. Although theoretically life could live on the edges of these big bangs indefinitely um, and survive, I believe, um, you know, indefinitely, if it was advanced enough, which I think it would be by the time uh, such a thing happened. But that said, um, I found that to be a very interesting comment, Deborah, that I've not heard, even though I um, do like Buddhism a lot and learn a lot from it. Um, I hadn't heard that particular uh, sutra. So um, thank you for sharing it. Um, Michael, you had your hand up. Did you want to share something else? Oh, no? the Ka Kai Fu wanted to um, say yeah. something? Go ahead, Kai Fu. Oh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, so <clears throat> just a comment on that. So we know in the universe, the cycles, right? The cycles in the galaxy. So is it possible that the F has, a, that was, you know, it's kind of tied to your multiple dimensional parallel universe. So is it possible that we may be in a different cycle that whatever we are doing now may have happened, let's say, infinitive number of years ago, and we are just, you know, because we expand and we contract, and now we are starting all about the new birth, the new age, they call it. So, but how do we know that we are in a cycle? That's, that's the thing. How would, it, how would you know you're in a box if you don't know what's outside the box? So by theorizing, right, and that's really what I've done is theorized of you know, what I tried to do is think deeply about um, the things that we've observed in our observable universe. And as usual, I tried to think one level more meta, like what if, what if this is not the only universe, right? Normally science says our visible universe is the only universe, but I said, well, what if there's more than one of these, right? And I theorized like, well, what if there's a bunch of them, like all happening throughout and you know, I also try to theorize what does the edge of space look like? And I couldn't imagine an edge of space because what's beyond that? What's beyond yep. the edge of space, which is what the ancient Greeks said, 
they said, imagine that I'm at the end of the universe and I shoot an arrow over the edge of the universe. Where does the arrow go? Right. Yeah. And mm -hmm. even the ancient Greeks realized there really should be no end, end of space. There should be no end. Like it's got to be infinite. And so that's where the Greeks thought that there was infinite time and space. Um, and I'm with them on that. I just came up with a model that describes the phenomena we observe from the Big Bang and puts it together with an infinite number of Big Bangs and brings it all together in a way that is cohesive and cyclical and, um, you know, is logically consistent with everything that we've observed. Um, and in fact, it, it creates an observation that um, if you look at the edges of our visible universe, um, they're accelerating, which you would think would be nonsense because yeah. if there was a big bang, right? Like energy should be dissipating as you get further yeah. away to the edges of the universe. And so things should be slowing down intuitively, but actually the things at the edge of the universe are accelerating. And if I'm right, the reason for that is that there's an infinite amount of mass energy pulling, you know, with gravita gra gravitational force the edges of our universe in every direction um and so or, or it could be the big bang wasn't the big bang there was something before the big bang that we don't know about that's what i'm describing is what was before the big bang yeah like that like dark energy or dark matter or something like that i don't uh, think it's dark energy or dark matter i think those are explanations for things that haven't been understood yet like and in fact, what I'm describing in terms of the acceleration of the edges of the universe are described by dark energy and dark matter by people who use complicated math to describe <laughs> it. But I would argue that the idea that there's an infinite amount of mass energy in every direction, 360 degrees, is actually a better explanation than dark matter or dark energy. But, but are you not contracting yourself in this case, saying that there's a big bang? If you mentioned, I think you say you were not, you know, you are not totally on board with the big bang theory. So why use so, the big bang to explain? So I'm on board with the observations, the physical observations from the big bang theory. What I'm not on board with is that time itself and the universe itself originated, Started it. okay. you know, at the All beginning right, of the big bang. Okay. I think the universe is infinite and has existed infinitely and that there Before are an infinite the number of big bangs happening throughout the universe all over the place. Um, so that that's where I agree with the observable parts. What I don't agree with is the hypothetical parts that are not even mathematically defensible, um, let alone logically defensible, you know, to say that there was a brute first moment in time. Where did, how did that moment first moment in time? I was about to ask that question. Now, what causes the big bang? What 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 causes that spike? I I think at the end of the day, I think the big bang and religion, I think, kind of merge into that. I think religion knows that they cannot go further beyond the the you know the bond of time, so they call it God, right? Science don't want to call it God, so they start with the big bang. And if you ask them, okay, what what really sparks where from the energy for the big bang? That's when they also don't have answer. So I think the old, the, the, our ancestors called those things God. There must be something greater that we don't know. We call it God that started the whole world. Okay. <laughs> all right. Yeah, and, and all I would say is that I, I do have a version of God that I can logically defend. And I think that, um, and so I believe in God. I believe in the version of God that I can logically defend. Um, but I agree with you that I think people historically used God to explain anything that they couldn't explain. And I think that's a fair explanation. Like if you yep. can't explain anything in any other way, it's okay to attribute it to God and to look for spiritual wisdom in those areas because let's face it, if science doesn't have a good answer, use whatever you can, right? Like yeah. use God, it's, use your friends, use your, you know, use it's, whatever it's resources your version you have. of God defense, like uh, from Descartes defense or you're more of what? Are you using God? Are you using Descartes to defend God? Um, I don't know what Descartes' God looked like, but I'm pretty sure that I don't agree with him because Descartes thinks that that animals don't have souls, and I think animals do have souls. So um, I think Descartes and I probably disagree on on God, is my guess. Although I don't know his concept of God super well. So that said, I I don't. If you don't mind, Kaifu, I we do have two hands up. So yeah, I do yeah, yeah. Mike and uh, uh, Mike, Mike and Mike, Michael. Um, so Mike Soren, go ahead first. Okay. I, I'm not sure I should add to the confusion, but uh, the statement about uh, whether the universe is running down or running up or uh, or is oscillatory has to do with an argument that uh, 
Einstein described as his worst mistake. His, his, his equation isn't really e equal mc squared. It's a series of tensor equations. And uh, in that, there's something called the cosmological constant. And if that cosmological constant is greater than, is either less than one or greater than one, we have a universe that is either uh, expanding uh, or uh, will eventually turn around. And uh, the, as a big bang, enter, empty space is not um, that, that simple. It's, uh, and and uh, as a property of empty, if you have a empty space in the same way that nature abhors a vacuum, um, empty space will eventually give rise to, uh, to a big bang uh, if you wait long enough. So uh, as far as conspiracy theories of multiple civilization, there's a guy named Graham Hancock who expanded on that and um, uh, uh, even beyond the Atlantis myth that uh, Plato had. So I, again, I yield the balance of my party hat time. Thank you. Um, so, um... Yeah, I, I, um, I don't, re I, I don't remember the details on the cosmological constant. So I, I'm going to try to do a quick um, refresher on that and come back to it if that's okay, and let Michael M go. Yeah, thank you. Um, so just a couple of things. I, uh, Garrett, I think I sent you an email. Uh, basically, I, I do have a conflict. I don't want to make this a personal thing with another outstanding group that happens to have their webinars are scheduled on the same nights as this one. So I'll be picking and choosing. So uh -huh. although as much as I really appreciate uh, participation in this group, I'm, I'm probably gonna have to pick and choose and attend. It cannot be, well, in multi-dimensional world, I, I should be able to attend both at the same time. <laughs> but, as of right Just now, time now, travel and that. duplicate yourself, Michael. Clone yourself. That's what I do. Yeah, I clone myself I, I, I for everything I need to. <laughs> so the second thing is, uh, I enjoy all these conversations, but I want to uh, just suggest that we go on these less on these general tangents and try to keep the conversations a little bit more rigorous. And I don't mind having theoretical conversations and. Um, uh, but I think if we try to ground it and at least have some level of uh, rig more rigorousness to it, rather than just going on tangents, because theories abound everywhere about everything. Yeah. So um, just wanted to give you my thought. No, I appreciate that. This is the most theoretical based conversation we've had in my memory. Um, we are almost always very focused on the practical. You noticed that, um, you know, I, I talked about critical thinking skills being the next series of uh, discussions we're going to have. It's going to be very practical, very hands-on, very, you know, we may even do workshops where we practice the skills that we're learning in the workshop. If I can have time to, you know, prepare for that, I don't know if I will or not, but, um, you know, no, most I, of what we do is- I, I'm with you. Practical. This was- Yeah. Yeah, this was a good conversation. I good. clearly read the title, was interested in the subject, but this was at least somewhat more rigorous, but we can talk about aliens, whether they exist or not. So there is so many directions you could go on that. So many theories, really ungrounded. These are nothing more than theories. So there's many, many subjects we could start discussing but I think it would just be that, <laughs> you know, uh, theories and I ideas on various things. Where did we come from? Uh, are we, um, you know, lineation of uh, an alien race? Are we not? Uh, without evidence, without rigorousness of discussion, um, I think we can put our, uh, you know, our time to better use. That's that's just my. Thought. Yeah, I agree with you. Like I said, this was kind of a filler for not having something last week on the calendar for this week, and we put it on kind of last minute. Um, and quite frankly, next week's is not on the calendar yet, and I need to get the descriptions created so that we can put them on the calendar. But I have about five sessions on critical thinking planned out um, that I kind of gave the roadmap for. So those are going to be the next 
probably five or six weeks. Um, so those will be very, very practical, very hands-on. This is, like I said, the like the rare exception that we go, you know, almost all in on theory. Um, it, it's generally practical. When we talked about free will, that was also, I think, very theoretical because, you know, most people who don't believe in free will are um, what I would call free will are uh, soft determinists, and they do believe in free will, where they believe in acting as if we have free will, even though they would argue that determinism is right as well. And so they believe in both determinism and free will, um, which I don't think is free will, because if determinism is right, there's only one possible future and there's no freedom in that free will. So I would argue that the only concept of free will that makes sense to me, although Hume disagreed and he's the one that sort of coined the term on uh, uh, compatibilism. And I read his book that did it and I still disagree with him. Um, I, I mean, I read a Cliff's Notes version of the book um, on Blinkist, um, but um, I, I think that in order for there to be free will and free will, there's got to freedom to be in free will. There's got to be some ability to make a non-determinist decision, which is libertarian free will. But anyway, that that was another theoretical one, but it was very popular. You know, we kind of grew out of the philosophical community, and so some people really like the philosophical stuff. I tend to like the practical stuff most of the time, but some of my essays are very theoretical. So I cover those too. All I'm saying is trying to bound the theoretical stuff, not yeah. to eliminate it. I think it's right. very good, but try to bound it. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I, I will try to focus on practical stuff most of the time. Um, whenever I have a choice, I'll choose a practical, um, practical application uh, topic. So that said, it is right around nine o'clock. So I kind of covered what we're going to cover um, in the next couple of weeks is research, info literacy, um, evidence evaluation. I'll share the screen again. Um, let me put the right. OK, so um, research and information literacy, evidence evaluation, which is deciding which facts out of the things we've researched are credible, and then being able to use formal logic to make really good conclusions, um, knowing what types of bias we have as human beings and which ones to avoid. We're just going to hit the high points of that. There are a huge number of biases. We can't cover all of them. Um, same with, uh, well, we're going to cover the types of inference and which ones are more reliable and less reliable and which ones to use when. And we're going to talk about fallacies, which are basically um, logic that seems sound but is not sound. And then we'll talk about how we can use all that to come up with knowledge of objective reality and then build on that knowledge of objective reality to create wisdom. I see these two as kind of like a bounce back and forth. You know, the more knowledge we have about objective reality, the better we can, you know, act on, you know, act wisely. Because if you have an unsound picture of objective reality, you can, what you think is wisdom will probably be folly. Um, and so we want to have a really clear picture of not you know objective reality and from that we can then um use a, use our wisdom to make the world a better place which means preventing significant unnecessary harm for all human beings and then increasing happiness and decreasing harm wherever we can for everybody we can influence so that's um you know so, go ahead this would be a very good parallel um neural net feedback to chat GPT to make it better, more logical, its conclusions more logical. Mm -hmm. Almost like hardwiring. No, you're not hardwiring, but rather you're teaching it logic. Yeah. You have to think of how you would want to experiment with that. But I think this would be a good parallel feedback loop into chat GPT to learn from. Yep. Cool. Well, thanks everybody for coming tonight. Um, hope everybody has a great rest of their night and hope to see you guys at future events. Um, Thank you, Garrett. Take care, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thanks for everyone for your comments and, and thoughtful questions. Bye-bye. Thank you.